So our, our, the first talk is by Shaquet Fleur, and he's going to talk about the semantics of uh, the ARM processors. Thank you. OK, good morning. I would like to present our work on a memory model, or actually an architecture model, for the ARM architecture. So we should start with why should we care at all? So. If one wants to reason about assembly code for ARM or ARM machine code, if one wants to reason about the Linux kernel or about compilers, one probably wants a model for the ARM architecture. And if it's a formal model, even better, right? And if we have one, we can also use it for validating ARM hardware. And in the context of ARM, that's quite important because ARM license the architecture to different companies who design and manufacture their own implementations of ARM. So if one goes to the reference manual and opens it, one will see a pose description of a memory model, which is, as a pose description, sometimes a bit ambiguous, uh, sometimes incomplete, and sometimes just doesn't make sense. Uh, another part of the reference manual describes each instruction in kind of isolation. It uses a sequential pseudocode, which is quite nice, but doesn't really suit uh, concurrency models. OK, so we want a formal model for the architecture, and we can't really use the reference manual because it's not formal enough. So why don't we use existing models? There is Salker's model for the power microarchitecture. Uh, that, that model was developed with the help of IBM staff. It has a power microarchitectural flavor to it. And as such, it's very good to establish confidence in it as a power model, but not so much as an ARM model, since the ARM microarchitecture is quite different, as we will see later, from the power microarchitecture. Uh, moreover, the ARM architecture has some instructions that just don't have counterparts in the power architecture. For example, the load acquire, the store release, the funky barriers. And in addition, we have this annoying litmus test, which is observed on real ARM hardware, but is forbidden by the power model. Uh, a litmus test, by the way, is a small assembly program, a concurrent program. Uh, accompanied with an initial state and some assertion over the final state, which we can then run on hardware and inspect the results and run on our models and compare the results with the hardware. OK, so the power model is, doesn't fit very well to the ARM architecture. So how about using Alglav's uh, axiomatic model for the ARM architecture? That's quite a nice model. It runs very fast on small tests, and it's quite analysis friendly. But although it might extensionally be equivalent to the architecture, it uses an obstruction that is very, very different from the microarchitecture itself. So how do you establish confidence in such a model? You have to rely heavily on testing. And we would like to do something better than that. We want to rely, we want to have discussions with ARM staff and establish the confidence in the model that way. Of course, we're going to have testing as well. So I hope you are convinced that having a formal model for the ARM architecture will be nice. And building such a model requires it to have a microarchitectural flavor to it. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, we developed uh, an a model for the architecture that has an ARM microarchitecture flavor to it. Um, we use similar mechanisms to, zo to those employed by the actual microarchitecture. And we incorporate a full ISA model into it based on the pseudocode found in the reference manual with some modifications to make it more suitable to concurrency model. And the entire thing is specified in a mathematical formal language in LEM and SAIL and is executable, allowing us to test it and compare it to real hardware. 
And we established confidence in the model by making it very, very similar to the microarchitecture that allows us to talk to ARM about it and make sure that it is actually the behavior that they meant for the architecture to have. And of course, we also run tests. We run thousands of tests just to test single instructions. We capture the states of hardware before running the instruction and the state on hardware after the inst instruction was run, and then we compare it with executions on the model. We do a similar thing using concurrent limits tests, run them both on hardware and then on the model and compare the results. Before we describe the model itself, let's take a quick look at what a microarchitecture may look like. Um, it's easy to imagine microarchitecture as two separate uh, components. One is the process, processor cores that fetch, decode, execute instructions. Those cores might employ all kinds of optimizations like out of order executions, uh, register shadowing. And then those cores, when they need to perform memory accesses, they communicate with some cache hierarchy and they interconnect, which ultimately results with a value for read or just accepting a write. Okay, so as you can expect, our model take a similar shape. Basically, the model is a transition system um, compo uh, composed of two subsystems, the thread subsystem here and the storage subsystem. The state of a thread subsystem is a tree of instructions in program order, and each instruction is governed by a sale interpreter, which is basically running the pseudocode from the reference manual. This pseudocode generates events such as read register, write register, memory access. Those events pass from the instruction to the thread subsystem, which then passes memory events to the storage subsystem. In the storage subsystem, those events flow down in a hierarchy similar to the cache hierarchy until they finally reach memory. Uh, this hierarchy business is not so nice as part of an architectural model. So we have an abstraction of it called POP, which we will discuss later on. Okay, I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about the storage subsystem now and then about the ISA model and the thread subsystem. So the flowing storage subsystem, the one more closely related to the microarchitecture, is a set of buffers, those rectangular things here, connected in a hierarchy with the memory at the very bottom. Each thread is associated with some buffer. Of course, we can have different hierarchies, and before we start to analyze the behavior of a certain program, we have to fix the hierarchy. So here are some examples for hierarchies. Okay, so when a thread issues a memory event, it will enter the top of the buffer associated with that thread. So in this example, thread zero issued a write, and it entered the buffer associated with thread zero. And now if thread zero issues a read, the read enters at the top and pushes the write down a bit. The bottommost event in a buffer, like the write here, can flow to the next buffer in the hierarchy, this one, okay? The bottommost event in the hierarchy itself can flow into memory. In the case of a write, it will simply change the, memo the memory value for that address. So x is gonna be one now. Adjacent events can be reordered. So the hierarchy and the buffers impose some kind of order over the events, but some events we don't really care about the order between them. For example, two memory accesses to different addresses, like a write to x and a read from y, we don't really care about the order between them, so the buffers allows us to reorder them if we want to. But when we have a read and a write to the same event adjacent to each other, we don't wanna reorder them. Reordering such two events will create violation of coherence. 
but instead we can generate a read response using the value from the write. So reads can be satisfied either from memory or from within the buffer, similar to uh, cache heat or miss, for example. Okay, so you can see that choosing different kind of hierarchies will affect the kind of behaviors you can observe, and that's not very nice. So we've developed the pop storage subsystem, which eliminates the hierarchy, and instead of having a buffer and hierarchy and all that, it just records an explicit partial order over the memory events, and it explicitly propagates each event to each thread. We proved this obstruction to be sound with respect to the flowing storage subsystem, and we imagine it being used, for example, to prove the correctness of a compilation scheme for C11. We're actually working on it. The instruction set model, okay, so previous models used to assume that instruction is sort of an atomic thing. It consists of register reads, register write, memory accesses that are all performed quite instantaneously, but actually the reference manual provide a sequential pseudocode describing the precise operations that are needed to be performed in order to execute an instruction. And no one guarantees that those in, though this pseudocode is a, an atomic unit that needs to be executed at once. Actually, if you consider it as such, a lot of the concurrent behavior that you would expect is actually forbidden. So to handle that, we use uh, SAIL, which is a domain-specific language we've developed in our group, um, to resemble the pseudocode, but also allow us to execute the pseudocode and interlace different instructions. Uh, SAIL has a lightweight dependent type system. We compile the SAIL code into LEM ASTs, and we incorporate in the thread subsystem the, a SAIL interpreter which traverse over those ASTs, and in each transition of the storage subsystem, we just perform one operation of the, of the interpreter, and in such way, we can interlace the different instructions. All of this is compiled into a tool. The, the ISA model is specified in LEM, and the concurrency model is in LEM as well. Both are exported to a COML. We add to it uh, an assembly parser that allows us to read limits tests and an ELF model, which allows us to read binaries. Uh, all of it is compiled into our tool, which allows you to explore behaviors either interactively or exhaustively for small test cases. Uh, this tool can be found on the internet. It has a web interface. You don't need to download anything. Okay, so let's go over a quick example. This is the state of the thread subsystem, the initial state of a thread subsystem. Uh, we don't see the storage subsystem here because it's not very interesting. It's quite, it's empty at the beginning. Uh, we can see in green the enabled transitions of the system, which is fetching the next inst instruction, and we can already see that it's going to be a store from address 50,000. So I'm going to perform that transition. I'm going to fetch the instruction. And now we can see that the instruction was fetched and already analyzed, but not performed yet. In blue, you can see the sale code, which is similar to the pseudocode found in the reference manual, that actually implements the instruction. You can see here the instruction itself. Uh, that is a store that gets its data from register X1. It gets its address from register X0. And in addition to storing the data into that address, it adds eight to the address and stores it back to X0. This is good because you can see that the next instructions that we haven't fetched yet is exactly the same instruction. Both of them read address from X0, but they are gonna be performed to different addresses because the first instruction 
already modified the value of x0. Let's go over the sale code of this instruction. Uh, each transition now is going to be the execution of the sale interpreter. So first thing the interpreter is going to do is going to read register n. n is 0. So you can see that it's reading x0. And it read the value 1,000, which was the initial value of that register. And you can see that the thread subsystem now notes that x0 was read. Next thing, we're just going to record the local variable address here. And then we're going to check if this is a pre-index instruction. This is not a pre-index instruction. This is a post-index instruction. And the next thing the sale interpreter will do is this special function, which informs the thread subsystem that a memory write is going to be performed to that address, but without the value yet. So the thread is now aware that a write is going to be performed, but it doesn't know the value that's going to be stored. It only knows the address. OK. The next thing the sale interpreter is about to do is perform the write back, writing the address plus 8 back to 0. Now, this is the interesting point, because the reference manual says that these three instructions, the performing of the write back, should be done at the very end of the instruction. But if we kept those lines in order as the reference manual required, we wouldn't be able to perform this instruction out of order, because it would be still waiting for the value of x0. So to make that right, we had to move the right back from being the very final instruction into the middle. So now this is the right back, so we're going to perform it. First, we're going to calculate the new address, 1008. And then we're going to store it back into x0. And now you can see that x0 got his new value. OK, finally, we read the data and perform the actual write. OK. The most important thing to take from this talk is that we provide a model which should be used as the foundation for, the f for any future formal work on top of the ARM architecture. You can use our tool to explore behavior of very small programs or pick one of the limits tests that we provide on the web interface. Um, if you want to create any kind of tool or any kind of obstruction for the ARM architecture, feel free to use our model to prove the correctness of your obstruction instead of going over the ARM reference and extract it from there. Thank you. Uh, hello. hello. I think you may have answered this question in your very last bullet there. But suppose I am reasoning about the behavior of source programs in this ISA or about optimizing compilers. Uh, should I do it in an Alglav style axiomatic semantics and then prove that sound by your model, or should I do it directly in your model? OK. Uh, very good question. Um, you probably want to create a new abstraction axiomatic model for that. Uh, but not necessarily. Uh, I'm working on a proof for the compilation scheme from C11 to that model. And it, it's not that complicated working with the operational model. And the C11 model I'm using is Betty's model, which is axiomatic. And it's not a big problem doing the translation from the axiomatic to the operational and vice versa. Uh, but you might want to because it's quite a complicated model. You had an, you had an example of a uh, behavior that was uh, possible under ARM, but not possible under power. Could you yes. put that back up again? Uh, just the name. It's MPDMB plus RFI, FRI, control ISB. <laughs> that, no, no, the, the litmus test was not the same one that is, that's not the litmus test, just an example for a litmus test. 
Oh, okay, that, that wasn't the particular litmus yeah, test. Yeah, that one is forbidden both on ARM and power. Okay, so is this the one where, sorry, technical, is this the one where a write happens, before, uh, there's a read and then a program order or later write and the write sort of yes, gets done before yes. the read? Yes, okay. okay. It didn't seem to match what you had on the slides. No, you're right, that was a different litmus test. So I'm puzzled that uh, there wasn't a formal specification uh, before you got started uh, from uh, ARM, uh, because uh, uh, in microprocessors, uh, they started using uh, uh, tools already in the 90s uh, to, to prove the correction, uh, correctness of, uh, of uh, multiplication circuits and so on. Uh, uh, and, and it's incredibly important uh, to sh when you ship uh, these uh, microprocessors that they are uh, correct. Uh, uh, how do you explain that, uh, that the, the state of the art uh, uh, within uh, ARM was uh, where it was? Uh, I don't know, maybe ask ARM people? <laughs> I think I can answer that question. Uh, the hardware makers for many years now have had very good tools for functional equivalence verification between the RTL level and the transistors. But between the ISA level and the RTL level, there's very little in any company, even the leading companies, partly because they don't have very good specifications of either level, formal specifications with which to do verification of. It's recognized. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so now our next speaker is Jean Pichon, uh, who's going to talk about a concurrency semantics for relaxed atomics that permits optimizations and avoids uh, thin air executions. Okay. So. We start from a sad and depressing state of affairs where more than 40 years after the first relaxed memory hardware was introduced, we still don't really know what it means to write a concurrent program that runs on top of that. So in this talk, we're going to focus on, let's say, the core of this issue. Of course, the paper highlights many problems, and the paper I quote here highlights many problems with that, but we're going to focus on the core, which is to design a memory model that specifies basically uh, what uh, read instructions can read in a concurrent program for a programming language as opposed to assembly where you manipulate a shared mutable state using what C called, uh, calls relaxed atomics, which are reads and writes that are meant to be mapped to plain assembly uh, loads and stores without barriers. So there's quite a lot of um, wiggle room for what the instructions can do. And we want to do that without allowing out of thin air. So what's out of thin air again? Well, to remind ourselves, let's first look at something that's not out of thin air, this example here. Um, so if we look at this program that initially has two locations, x and y, which are 0, or two threads here and there, the first thread reads x. If it read 42, then it writes that to y. So it sort of forwards conditionally 42 from x to y, and the second thread reads y. If it read 42, it writes 42 to x, and otherwise, it does exactly the same. So if you look at this program, it's completely reasonable for a compiler to go, oh, wait, it does the same thing in both branches. We can just collapse the conditional. And now it's completely reasonable for either the hardware or uh, the compiler to go, oh, wait, this is a load from y, and this is a store to x of a constant, so there's no reason not to reorder those. If we look at this program now, well, it can start by writing 42 to x, read it there, write 42 to y, and this can read uh, 42 here. So it's completely reasonable for this program to read uh, 42 in both threads. And it's a thing that happens, like if you run it on your favorite compiler, on your favorite hardware, it might happen from time to time, or maybe all the time. Uh, however, if, so because it's a reasonable outcome for the uh, result of the transformation, it's a completely reasonable outcome for the original program. However, if we remove the else branch, 
then it doesn't make any sense because the previous argument that was, well, somehow the 42 happened in all cases, so we could start with it, doesn't work for this program because if this reads 42, for example, then the only way it can read it is from there. The only way it could have read it from there was if it read it there, which means that it must have been written there, and we have this sort of circular reasoning that wasn't there previously. And in fact, no combination of hardware and compiler out, uh, optimizations lead to this so-called out of thin air outcome where the values just pops out out of thin air. And if they did, it would be a bug. If you look at all these papers, they sort of explore the consequences of it. And basically, if you have a separation logic, well, the only thing you can say about reading a, um, a relaxed read is it reads something, God knows what. And it completely breaks compositionality and um, this paper and so on. The issue is, well, uh, we can look at this program and go, yes, this is clearly an out of thinner outcome. Uh, there's no general characteri characterization. So we're in front of a specification problem. We have some examples of uh, bad outcomes, but we don't have a general notion of what it means to be bad like that. So look at uh, the sort of two main uh, memory models that uh, suffer from this issue. Well, they all suffer from this issue, but these actually try to tackle the issue and they fail, which is quite sad. So if we look at uh, the C memory model, how it works is it looks at individual executions. And if you look at the individual execution of this program, where it reads 42 into both threads, what happens is this reads 42, right? So it writes 42, this reads 42, and then writes 42. And so this program where we have this sort of loop has to be, this execution where we have this loop has to be allowed because we're looking at this execution and we want to allow the corresponding behavior. The problem is it's also an execution of this program. So C11 sort of overshoots and allows uh, out of thin air outcomes. And again, this is a specification problem. So like no C11 compiler makes this outcome possible, but if you're a programmer programming against the C11 memory model, then you have to take this into account with the disastrous consequences we saw before. If you look at the Java memory model, it sort of suffers the other way around. So it doesn't exhibit out of thin air. The way it does it is basically to check that an execution is allowed, you build a sequence of executions where the nth execution justifies the n plus oneth execution being able to read uh, the values that it reads, but it doesn't have to completely agree on uh, what exact executions path are taken. So by doing this, it manages to apparently avoid out of thin air. The issue is that it also avoids things that are completely reasonable. So for example, uh, common sub-expression elimination is not sound, as is shown by these people. Uh, so if you look at this program where we read x, if we read 42, we read it again, and then we store what we wrote, and otherwise, we write 42, it's completely reasonable. I mean, we're reading x twice. It's completely reasonable to merge the second read into the first. And then we end up with what is basically the second thread of the first program we were looking at before. But in Java, it's not sound. So what happens is people who program in Java just ignore the Java memory model. And when they program, they have to think about what they know the compiler is actually going to transform their code to and how the hardware is going to deal with that. And that's a bit sad. So if we're a bit wishy-washy and we sort of go, what, what seems to be wrong with these approaches? Well, C looks at executions individually, and clearly it can't distinguish the things. And Java looks at sequences of partial executions. But it's not how hardware and compilers operate. They don't like build sequences of executions and look at uh, executions individually. What they do is that they look at all execution paths. So what we're going to do is to do exactly that. So our approach is an operational semantics that tries to match the operational intuitions that we have about how hardware and compilers operate. And as Shaked did before, we split the problem in two. We have a storage subsystem that deals with the propagation effects uh, between threads. And we have thread subsystems that deal with thread local effects like out of order issuing and merging and so on. Uh, to represent the state of a thread, we use event structures which um, can represent all the possible conflicting executions of the thread. 
for our purpose, an event structure is a set of events, a labeling of the events with uh, memory actions, program order, and a conflict relational events that says, well, basically, if you have this, then you can't have that at the same time. So for example, if we have a load, we're going to model it with either the load reads zero or it reads one, but it can't read both, obviously. And for example, if we look at this program, the corresponding event structure is hit this. So if we store, we have a store. And then if we read after that, we have program order or the reads and the all the possible values for the reads, and they're all conflicting. So you can't, I mean, it has to read one of the values, not all of them. Implicitly, there's a conflict between this and this, and so on. And like, it's sort of the obvious thing. Like, there's nothing surprising about this event structure. Uh, the point is, this looks like the right basis to start working, because we can distinguish the threads that uh, C couldn't. So if we have the program where we have the else branch, then uh, we have the right in all the branches, whereas here we can clearly see that the right occurs only in one of the branches. And it also has the nice property that it abstracts over how uh, the flow of the program is expressed. So if we have a conditional that does nothing, then it's the same as not having the conditional. Uh, so if you know about event structures, I'm going to do ungodly things with them. Uh, so like, hardware and compiler optimizations do lots of like very complex and fine uh, manipulations of things. So hardware issues memory actions out of order, according to some bizarre rules. Uh, instruction scheduling reorders uh, memory actions of the program. Common self-expression elimination sort of merges memory actions into others, and so on. And GCC and Clang have hundreds of passes. And we can't hope to sort of mimic those in fine detail. What we try to do instead is to do some rewriting over our event structures. Uh, to abstract over the kind of transformations that uh, compilers and hardware do. So the first kind of step is the obvious. Well, if we have sort of an, a an action at the top of our event structure that is ready to execute, we can try to execute it. We can issue it to the storage subsystem and see if it is OK. So if, we have, if we're ready to write 42 to Y or to read x, we can try to read 0 for x, and the storage subsystem might say yes or no. And if it says yes, then we can continue with the write to y, and then the continuation. Or we can do that with, we can try that with 42, or we can issue the write and then continue with the read. And this, these execution steps are interleaved with uh, the other steps of the semantics. So it's sort of jitting while executing, so it's modifying uh, the code of the thread while it's executing it. Uh, an example of modification step is the ordering. So if we read something, and then in all the branches of the read, we do the same memory action, then there's no reason to not execute uh, that memory action first. So what we can do is just pull it out. So we remove the, the program order from the read to the right and just put the right next to the read. And this can occur deep inside the event structure. Another kind of thing that we saw the, uh, is merging of memory actions, which was uh, the thing that Java struggled with. What we do is we just bake it in, as in, if we take our example from before, we can, so we read x. If we read 42, we read x again, and then we write what we read. And otherwise, uh, we write 42. We can just merge this second. Uh, read of x into the first, and we just keep what happened in a case where we read the same thing. Another thing that I didn't mention is that um, compiler optimizations are often uh, supplemented by analysis that uh, try to extend their applicability by finding out properties of the program. So for example, alias analysis looks at this program and determines, oh wait, we have two pointers, p and q, and we're doing a comparison on them. But we know by looking at this that actually P and Q can't alias the same region of memory. So we can just remove this whole uh, conditional. And the memory model needs to account for that somehow. The way we do this is by allowing the memory model to make bets. So if we have this program that reads x, and then if it reads uh, 42, it writes uh, 37 to z, and otherwise it writes 42 to y. And if somehow, by looking at the behavior of the whole program, we determine that actually this can't happen, 
we're out to make a bet that it's not happening. And this allows us to ignore the possibility where 42 is read for x. And this enables further the ordering steps and mergings and so on. So for example here, if we, the sort of offending branch is ignored now, we can do this deordering because this happens in all branches. Of course, there's a sort of slight circularity, which is uh, knowing that this is impossible depends on the behavior of the whole program. So starting from the state after the uh, bet, we have to make sure that there's no further execution that actually executes this read, otherwise the bet was wrong. So to conclude, uh, how do we know that we've avoided out of thin air? Well, as I said, it's a specification problem, so we can't be certain. But if we look at how the memory model treats uh, our two examples that we had to distinguish, so the one with uh, the uh, else branch and the one without, and we look at the event structures, if we look at this thread here, if we have the else branch, then we have this memory action in all branches, so we're going to be allowed to deorder it and then to start the execution where both threads read 42. If we remove this, we're kind of stuck. We have to start by reading something, and the only thing that's available is zero. So the 42-42 outcome is not possible in the case where we don't want it to be possible. So somehow it seems that uh, this memory model constructs the execution uh, incrementally and where reads have to read values that are there. Uh, unlike the C11, which sort of allowed self-justifying executions, here it has to be built incrementally. Uh, and this is also validated by uh, some uh, litmus testing on the classical out of thin air examples and a few more. Like it seems to do the right thing for uh, the fragment of C with uh, relaxed reads and writes and non-atomic reads and writes and locks. Uh, it also seems to deal quite well with the problem of undefined behavior found by uh, Batty et al with uh, where basically in C11 you have undefined behavior and you have weak memory concurrency but if you look at the combination of the two, it doesn't make sense. Basically, any program with a potential source of undefined behavior actually triggers it. And the basic idea is to treat undefined behavior as a sort of joker for the transformations we did on the event structures. Uh, so it seems to be the best solution we have so far. It seems to avoid out of thin air, but it's got a bit too many moving parts. It, like, it seems to be extensionally good. When we try it on examples, it seems to work but if you try to reason about it, it's just absolutely horrible because you have to take, consider all the possible betting steps and you have towers of exponentials of complexity. Uh, but it seems to work, so we'd like to try to extend it to reach feature parity with C11, prove that it's strictly included in C11, check that you can actually implement it on hardware and that the syntactic op optimizations that you would expect to be sound are sound. Thank you. Okay, any questions? <clears throat> you, have, you have several steps of deordering and various other things to relax the behaviors, bets and so on. Is it clear that, uh, that none of those could be expressed as a sequence of the other steps? Have you got the sort of minimal set of weakenings you might have for the strength you've got? There's some amount of overlap between the steps, but I, like, I haven't tried to sort of build a minimal thing in any way, but they seem to uh, cater for different aspects of what the hardware and the compilers do. Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, our next speaker is uh, John Wickerson, uh, who's going to talk about uh, overhauling our SC atomics in C++.
Is the microphone working? Yep, great. Cool. So uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, this is a report on joint work with uh, Mark Batty and Ali Donaldson. So the object of our study, or the, the objects of our study, uh, are the memory models of two programming languages, C11, which I guess most of you will know, uh, and OpenCL. OpenCL, uh, for those who don't know, is an extension of C for doing parallel programming um, on exotic hardware like GPUs, FPGAs, and so on. Uh, what is a memory model? Um, so it's the, basically it's the part of the language specification that tells you if you load from a shared memory location, what can you get? And like all parts of the language specification, it's, it's a contract. You can see it as a contract between the programmer and the compiler writer. It defines the expectations and the obligations of both parties. So the C11 memory model is really four sub-memory models all glued together. You've got the part that gives the semantics of ordinary non-atomic memory stores and loads. You've also got the semantics of various atomic operations. These all happen indivisibly. And they come in several flavors. The sequentially consistent atomics, they're the strongest. They guarantee, they're guaranteed to take effect in some order that corresponds to an interleaving of the instructions from the threads. They're very nice and simple for programmers, uh, but they're not necessarily that efficient. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got relaxed atomics. These are very hard for programmers to work with um, because their effects can be reordered pretty randomly, uh, but they could be quite efficient. Um, and then somewhere in between, you've got acquire release atomics. So for this piece of work, we're focusing on this quadrant, the SC atomics. Now, if you know anything about sequential consistency, you'll know that it's simple. That's the whole point of it. So you might expect that this quadrant of the memory model would not be very interesting, probably a bit too simple. In fact, it's actually the most complicated bit of the memory model. And the reason for this is that in a single program, you can mix together all these different sorts of memory operations. And so defining uh, the semantics of these in the presence of all these other interactions becomes really complicated. So what have we done? Our first contribution is to suggest a slightly stronger model. So what do I mean by stronger here? Again, thinking in terms of this contract, we found that the original contract gave slightly too much freedom to the compiler writers in terms of which behaviors programmers, programs were allowed to exhibit. No existing compilation scheme was taking advantage of these freedoms. So we took them away. That in itself is neither here nor there. It's a very small change, hardly anybody's going to notice. But what that does is it unlocks a whole barrage of simplifications that can be made to this part of the model. So our main contribution is to massively simplify the semantics of SC atomics. To give you an indication of how much simpler uh, our new proposal is, this is the text of the C11 standard that defines the semantics of SC atomics. And we're working in a formal setting, but if you translate our changes in a formal mathematical language back into prose, the new version would look about this size. And I should emphasize, I haven't just sort of made the text really suddenly very dense and used, uh, you know, words like that. This is conceptually much, much simpler as well. And this is important. I mean, because if you know anything about the C11 memory model, you know it's fantastically complex. Um, concurrent programming is hard enough without having to battle against an incredibly obtuse uh, language specification. So we think this is quite an important contribution. Not only is our simpler model easier for humans, but it's also easier for computers. And what I mean by this is if you consider a tool that is designed to calculate for a given program all of the possible executions of that program, with our new model, this can be done much more efficiently. 
and I'll explain shortly how that works. The OpenCL uh, memory model inherits most of the C11 memory model. Um, so many of our results for C11 carry over pretty straightforwardly to OpenCL. In the case of OpenCL, we went slightly further, and we also slightly weakened the model. So here, we found that the original uh, contract of OpenCL imposed too many obligations on the compiler writer to the extent that we could find some OpenCL programs that it was actually impossible to compile efficiently. So we removed some of these obligations. Now, in this talk, I'm afraid I won't have time to talk about OpenCL anymore. It's all in the paper. I'm going to focus just on C11. So I'm going to tell you a tiny bit about how the C11 memory model works via a single example. So here's a C11 program. Uh, you see we've got two uh, locations, X and Y, both of them declared as atomic. We've got four threads. And in these threads, we've got a variety of stores to memory, loads from memory. Um, some of these stores are annotated as relaxed atomics. Uh, here we've got a SC atomics. Uh, so yeah, not much else going on. What's the semantics of this program? Now, the semantics is calculated in two phases. The first phase is to map from this source code into a set of candidate executions. These candidate executions can be thought of as like concurrent traces. So it's a, it's a trace-based semantics. And these traces look like mathematical graphs. Nodes of the graphs are runtime memory events. And you'll see that the stores uh, correspond to writes. The loads correspond to reads. Um, these initial writes correspond to non-atomic writes here. Um, we've got the relaxed writes here, SC write over here. Uh, SB, that's sequenced before, so that captures the original ordering of the instructions uh, from those threads. And because these are runtime events, we have specific values. So here we're reading the specific value two. The set of all of these candidate executions will range over all numbers that you could shove here. So here's another execution with different numbers, and another, and another, and another, and so on. The second phase of calculating the semantics is to take each execution in turn and say, is it actually an execution that could happen? This is done by first saying, can we find a relation, RF, reads from, that, just, oops, that justifies every read in the execution with a write that supplies its value. Then, can we find another relation, MO, modification order? And this has to link all of the writes to the same location in a total order. So here, the modification, for, modification order for x takes this write to x, to this write to x, to this write to x. And the modification order for y goes from this right to y to this one. Thirdly, can we find a total order called s that goes over all of the sc atomics uh, that appear in the execution? So s uh, is the relation that puts the sequential in sequential consistency. Then, from these primitive relations, we make a bunch of derived relations. So happens before, HB, that's derived from sequenced before and a couple of other things. Uh, happens before on the same location, another derived relation. Uh, from read, that's another derived relation, and that one comes from, if, if this is your chain of modifications to X, going along here, and you've got some reads of X sort of dangling off uh, like this, from read takes you from your read of x to all of the writes to x that are later than the write that you saw. Okay, so from read goes like that. Okay, so now we've got a whole load of relations in our graph. The final stage is to look for certain shapes in this graph. And if we spot any of these shapes that I'm about to show you, the execution is deemed inconsistent and we throw it away. One of the shapes that's forbidden is this one. So if if I'm this read of x here, and I'm reading from an sc write to x that is earlier in modification order than another write to x, then that is earlier 
than me in the S order, that's forbidden. So this is a bit brain melting, of course. What does this shape mean? I haven't given any intuition for it. What's the impact on programmers? Where did it come from? I'm afraid I won't have time to explain where all of these shapes come from, so I'm going to take a, a formalistic approach, I suppose, so purely talking in terms of these geometric shapes. Another shape that's forbidden is this one. So here, if I'm, a, I'm reading x here, uh, I'm not allowed to read from a right to x that happens before another right to x that is my immediate predecessor in the s relation, uh, the, the immediately preceding right to x in the s relation. Okay? Again, another mouthful. Uh, s is not allowed to contradict happens before. That's a bit simpler. S is not allowed to contradict modification order, even in the presence of fences on the left and the right-hand side. Uh, here, this, this question mark is uh, reflexive closure. So really, this is, this is uh, an optional edge here in the graph on the left and the right-hand side. Um, here's another shape. This shape is pretty similar to this one, uh, except I've got, uh, I, ha I haven't got this uh, restriction here, and I've got uh, a fence on the left-hand side. This shape, pretty similar again. I've got, this time, the fence is on the right-hand side, and I've got another shape with a uh, fence on the left and the right. Okay, so these are all of the shapes that are forbidden that relate in some way to the S relation. And this is the relation that I'm really uh, probing in, in this work. All of these axioms, of course, can be rewritten in proper maths, so looking something like this. So this is irreflexivity of this relational expression. Uh, semicolon is relational composition. And if you look at these axioms in the context of all of the uh, C11 axioms, all 12 of them, minus consume atomics, um, you'll see that the S axioms take up an inordinate proportion of the total number of axioms. Seven out of 12 relate to SC, which should be the simplest part of the model. So there's a lot of opportunity for minimizing this bit. So a, a, a comment on these. So, um, this is a slightly different formulation of the C11 memory model. It has been formalized before. Uh, this formalization of the axioms is um, in a restricted form where all of the axioms are of the form irreflexivity or emptiness um, of a <coughs> relational expression that is quantifier free. The reason for doing the axioms in this form, which by the way we proved in whole to be equivalent to the previous formalization by Batty et al is that we could plug these axioms, just as they are, into the herd memory model simulator. This is a, a simulator that um, is able to calculate all of the executions of a given small program. And it's very efficient for hardware memory models. And we, our initial motivation for this work was we wanted to play about with that uh, in the context of the C11 memory model. So the simplifications that we discovered were sort of an accident, uh, but really they, they came about in a sense because of the way that we had to force these axioms into this restricted language uh, like this. Okay, so uh, I'm now gonna tell you how we simplified these axioms. So here are the forbidden shapes again. We're gonna make two changes, two very small changes. The first is we're going to say, rather than this right here having to be the immediately preceding right to x in the s order, I'm just going to say that this has to be any preceding right to x in the s order. Why do I feel that that's a justifiable change? Well, this is actually exactly the same change that Victor Vafiedis and his colleagues pr proposed at Popple last year. Uh, they were working in a different uh, context of validating compiler optimizations. And we're going to take their proposal and repurpose it because it helps us. The other small change that we're going to make is we're gonna drop the restriction here that this right here has to be SC. We're just gonna say any old right there. Why do I feel that that's a justifiable change? Well, basically nobody's gonna notice. And the, 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 to, to clarify, um, the only sort of execution that's actually going to be able to notice this change is the execution that I happened to use as my running example earlier. Um, that program had an execution like this. And there's something a bit funny about this execution because I'm reading x at 1 here because I'm reading it from this right over here, 
But this write happens earlier in the modification order than this write, which updates x to two, and this write to x is earlier in the s order than I am, so in a sense, this read is getting quite a stale value. And it's a bit funny that this is, was allowed by the C11 memory model. As it happens, no compiler scheme, uh, no, no compilation scheme would ever give you an execution that looked like this. Okay, we, we proved that. And so this is a justification for why it's okay to say that such executions are no longer allowed. So we've made those two small changes, and now, we can unleash a barrage of simplifications. So this shape becomes a special case of this one, so we can get rid of it. These four shapes are all now become symmetrical enough that they can all be collapsed into uh, a single one where the, um, the fences on the left and the right are now optional. Um, and now these three shapes all become um, factorizable into a single shape where we just have a union over those three possibilities for this edge here. And we're done. So we've managed to collapse all those, those seven axioms into just one pretty simple axiom. So there we go. Uh, and if we look at that uh, in the context of all of the axioms, that's the complete set before and after our change. We've, yeah, made the model quite a lot smaller. So finally, I want to talk a little bit about the um, simulation efficiency side of things. So we took the simplified axioms and we shoved them into herd. We said, calculate the, uh, all the behaviors of some small C11 program. And the results were not very good. Um, so Along this axis, I have the size of the program uh, increasing here. So the program that we considered for this, for this graph uh, was an n-threaded version of uh, Decker's mutual exclusion uh, algorithm, so store buffering, if you, if you know your litmus tests. Um, and uh, the, the number of threads, n, is increasing uh, linearly along this axis here. Um, and the simulation time, uh, as you can see for herd, is, is well, yeah, not good. Um, in contrast, uh, CDS checker, this is by um, uh, Norris and Dembski from a couple of years ago. Um, this is a, another memory model simulator that's fine-tuned just for the C11 memory model. Okay, so unlike HERD, which is completely generic. And their performance is much better. So we stared at the axioms that we, we, we had a little bit, and they can be seen as being of this form. So we have, remember, the, we had to existentially quantify over three relations, and then we had a bunch of axioms, and then here's our new uh, SC axiom here. And basically what this axiom is saying is that you must be able to find for me a total order over the SC atomics that is, in a sense, compatible with this relational expression here. That's what the irreflexitivity check is doing. So we figured that if we can just constrain that this right-hand side here has to be a partial order, then since every partial order can be extended to a total order that's compatible with it, um, we would be able to know that such an S would exist without having to construct it. So specifically, we, we did a further rewrite uh, to say, if we just make sure that this right-hand side is acyclic, so a partial order, then S will have created the conditions under which that total order will exist, um, but we don't need the simulator to have a for loop that sort of iterates over all of those possible total orders. So the simulation should be much more efficient. And we tried it, and indeed it is. Um, so the performance is now comparable uh, to the highly efficient uh, CDS checker, which um, works in a, a very different way. It doesn't sort of enumerate all of the uh, candidate executions uh, like herd does and then filter them down. Um, so although we're not you know, a lot better than CDS checker, we, we think it's, uh, it's encouraging that we can get such good performance um, from a completely generic uh, memory model simulator uh, without any specific optimizations. And, and moreover, herd, um, unlike CDS checker, is completely exhaustive uh, for loop-free code. 
So uh, there we go. Um, our, our results then, so we, we slightly strengthened the C11 memory model. Uh, this led to a much simpler model and a model that is much easier to simulate as well. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So you've strengthened the memory model, and so you've imposed at least formally more constraints on the compiler. Now you you said that you proved that uh, no compiler would ever do any of these things that they're not allowed to do anymore. How would you even state such a theorem? So it's so how did we state that theorem? Yeah. Go. In previous work, we proved that uh, compiler mappings from C11 primitives to little scripts of machine code uh, preserve the semantics of the memory model over the memory model of the given machine. So for that, we did that for x86 and power. Uh, and what we did to check that these strengthenings, uh, we, we essentially checked that these strengthenings didn't break those proofs. So this isn't a proof about a real compiler. It's a proof about uh, a, a mapping from uh, the primitives of the C11 language to the underlying uh, underlying machine's instructions. Uh, it doesn't take into account, for instance, compiler optimizations. But these are SC accesses, uh, so uh, right now my understanding is that compilers don't optimize them. A nice talk. So you, you basically constructed S from other relations. Uh, the oh, uh, in the in the in that final version where where it had the acyclicity yes. condition. Yes. So my question yeah. is, do you think it is also possible to construct mo modification order as well? Um, so we we certainly we did certainly think about that. Um, the the thing about uh, those the thing about the axioms on S was they were all of the form S must not contradict this relational expression, that they all just happens to fall into that form. Um, and it was quite you know, happy that it, it did that. MO just doesn't take that form, um, so it's not, it's not obvious that you can do it. It's not, it's it's, obvious it's not that obvious that you can't, you can't but. Um, Sorry, there's a counterexample in Ali Sashkin's thesis to, be, to being able to do this with modification order. Uh, so I have another question, or so there was a question about kind of the compiler side. I have a question about the application side. So are there any known algorithms written in C++ that actually use SC atomics in a non-trivial way where that would be useful so that, you know, I could look at your strengthening and check whether it allows me to write, you know, better algorithms or? Um, so, so you can, so yeah, uh, um, I did quite a, a, a bit of searching for, for finding algorithms that really you know, need SC atomics and uh, ended up coming up with a, something of a, a proof that you actually don't need them, uh, which is that you can implement locks using acquire and release uh, and then just, just sort of use, uh, re replace all the SC stuff uh, with locks and, and you're, you're basically done. Um, so in a sense, you don't need SC atomics except for the fact that um, that the use of locks in that way would, uh, you'd have to make sure that you use the locks consistently like that throughout your entire program, uh, so it would be fundamentally not compositional. Um, you know, you don't know how, you know, you can't, you can't, you wouldn't be able to interact with a, another piece of code that uses C11 SC atomics if they weren't using them in your way. Um, so other than that, I, I think it's Decker's algorithm and variants on Decker's algorithm are the best um, examples that we could come up with that really seem to be using SC atomics because they're, they're relying on uh, not being able to see, uh, see store buffering, which is something that only SC atomics really rule out. Okay. Any other questions? No? Then let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.